I'd like to greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to thank God for the gift of life and this blessed opportunity for us to share in God's word. We are going to be following a series based on the three angels' message in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 14. And as we follow this uh, series, I invite you to come and join with me as we learn from this prophetic message, from this profoundly prophetic book with such significance, particularly for the times that we are living in. We are coming to you from Durban, and we are going to be with each other for the next uh, three Sabbaths as we look into this portion of Scripture. Our reading today is from the book of Revelation, chapter 14, and we are reading from verse 6 of Revelation, chapter 14, and it says, And I saw another angel flying through the sky, carrying the eternal good news, to proclaim to the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Fear God, he shouted. Give glory to him, for the time has come when he will sit as judge. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are so grateful for the opportunity to not only read your word, but also for the Holy Spirit who provides meaning as well as power for the word to be experienced in our lives. And so we pray that having read the word, may he guide us into proper interpretation and meaning, and also may he give us power to be able to implement the word in our lives. This we pray through Christ Jesus. Amen. When we look at the prophetic messages of the Bible, the key greatest books that are often at the center is the book of Daniel as well as the book of Revelation. And of course, the prophetic message also spreads out through Matthew, Ezekiel, Hosea, and other chapters in the Bible scriptures. When we read the book of Daniel, as it comes to an end, we are left with a particularly comforting yet incomplete sin. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 12 in verse 1, then Michael shall stand. But of course, at his standing, we are not given the complete picture of the final end result of this standing. Instead, while looking with anticipation, we find there that Daniel is instructed to close the book and rest because the time at which these things will be fulfilled has not yet come. It is therefore necessary for us to understand that the book of Revelation becomes the instruction to open that book, that which had been sealed in the book of Daniel. When the book of Revelation opens, it opens first with a caution that we must all have. When John begins his vision, he says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that becomes very significant in understanding the book. Often, the book of Revelation, when studied, has led many people to come up with many different theories about the end time, and unfortunately, many of those theories have nothing to do with Jesus. This is because the opening of the book has been ignored. John did not say, this is the revelation about the beast. He did not say, this is the revelation about persecutions. He says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which means in every chapter and every verse of this book, if Jesus is not discovered, then the reader is not following what, what John is revealing to us. The whole book, many people have walked away with the triple six, Illuminati's, Freemasons, and all sorts of theories. And I have been in audiences where great care has been taken to present the book of Revelation. Yet, no matter how well articulate the preacher or the teacher was, from beginning to end, they never said anything about Jesus. And that leads to the problem that we have. So many of us, particularly as Seventh-day Adventists, the world no longer takes us seriously when it comes to the book of Revelation. In many ways, we sound like schizophrenics because instead of anchoring on what the book is about, 
We have run away with all sorts of conspiracy theories which are not rooted in the message of the book. Consider, for example, how in the past, every president that came into the United States, we would then come up with these theories that this is the one that would bring the Sunday law. These gentlemen would come and go and they would have done nothing. Slowly we began to deteriorate and erode our credibility in interpreting this book because instead of listening to the book, we are rushing for conspiracy theories. How many popes have come and gone? And we do the same. With every pope, we run around making publications. This is him. He will bring Sunday law. The old man comes, does whatever he does, dies and is buried. No Sunday law. Clearly, we need to revisit the book and listen to the book rather than pursue conspiracy theories about the book. And so for me, it is important that we begin where John began. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Why does that matter? Because in the book of Daniel, predominantly God's children are in bondage. In other words, in the book of Daniel, the devil is in control, symbolized through Babylon and the succeeding kingdoms that followed after Babylon. God's children remain under oppression. That is the greater scope of the book of Daniel. And even as we continue from Daniel 7 to Daniel 11, looking at what is happening, the theme remains, the kingdoms of earth have influence over the kingdom of God. When the book of Daniel closes, therefore, we are dealing with a articulation where God's people, though they are surviving, they are surviving under the umbrella of earthly domination. When the book of Revelation begins, the tables are turned. This book is about the kingship of Jesus Christ. This book is about how Jesus finally responds on behalf of his children and how the children of God are protected. If you notice very well, in the book of Revelation, very little concerns the children of God. In the book of Revelation, as early as Revelation chapter 5, God's children are sealed and set aside. What follows are plagues. What follows are calamities, which no longer affect God's people. They affect those who have rejected God's uh, message of salvation. Because the book of Revelation is about God's answer to the cries and the prayers of his children. In the book of Revelation, we who are in Christ suffer temporarily, but immediately God responds on our behalf because the entire book establishes what Christ is doing in the final end or in the final days of earth. And so this one book that we are reading is not read with fear. Whoever reads the book of Revelation and walks away fearful, that already tells you, you are not in the camp of Jesus Christ. Because for those who are in the camp of Jesus, this book offers no threats. Our fear ended in the book of Daniel where we were under the control of earthly kingdoms. In the book of Revelation, we are sealed, anointed, and set aside. We are then put in the book of life, and God now judges the earth, which has rejected his message. To anyone listening to this message, if you believe in Jesus, then nothing written in the book of Daniel compromises you or should bring you to fear. This book should make every believer in Jesus Christ say, Lord, I am ready for your coming. Let your will be done and your glory revealed. One of the chapters that then best reveals this to us is chapter 14. Remember again, the prelude to chapter 14 is 13. In chapter 13, the beast has come. 
and in his coming, he has forced the nations of the world to worship him. Not only that, an image of the beast has followed, one that has also pushed for a, a, a forced worship, making sure that the world worships the beast. And I think that is very important for us to understand, that worship is at the center of what is happening here, which means if we are going to try and identify the beast and his image, we need to monitor very carefully three things that are working in tandem. One, it is clear that the beast has his target set on issues of worship, which means spirituality, theology, church, and how church is done will be one arm of what the beast will use. Secondly, the beast has authority to enforce laws, which means there is a political part of this beast. Because in order to enforce laws, in order to have authority that changes the way people do things, you will need to have access to some form of uh, political systems, whether they be represented through democratic systems or communist or socialist or parliamentary or kingly systems, it does not matter. At the end of the day, the beast uses political power as well. Lastly, since the whole point of worship comes from a beast who produces an image, it seems to mimic the God who reproduces himself through his son, Jesus Christ. And so the third aspect here is the desire to be godly, to overshadow the real God and his real son, Jesus Christ, with another form of a false God and a false form of redemption. And so these three are the key paradigms. I say this so that the reader is wise enough to know we are not in search of a particular single thing found in one particular organization, but rather anyone understands if you want to conquer the world, you need to have representation in as many places as possible. To narrow the interpretation of the beast, to a single organization or a single country and an individual is to betray the full message that we see in the book. Here we are not just dealing with an individual or a country. Yes, there may be individuals who hold a predominant playing role at a particular time. But the reality is that we are dealing with a system here with its complexities. It is organic. In other words, the world will not be deceived by one individual using one organization and one country. Instead, in every country, in every organization, in every church, in every business, in every government, there is an attempt to capture the message of redemption and to manipulate it in such a way that the world no longer focuses on Jesus Christ. We are not to be consumed by searching for individuals, but we must be consumed by identifying error Error mixed with truth in every place and format where it may appear. No one is immune. And we are going to deal with this concept of immunity when we reach the third angel and his message. The first angel, however, then calls us to this message. The Bible says, Then I saw another angel flying through the sky. Of course, the message is another because there are a number of angels involved in this message that we are reading. Flying through the sky represents the unlimitedness of the message that is being brought by this particular angel. The angel is not rooted on the ground, neither is the angel standing on a cloud. Flying in the sky symbolizes that this message will not be stopped either way. It will spread and it will be heard in every part of the world. 
The second part that the angel introduces us to is that this angel is carrying an eternal uh, gospel of good news, the euangelion as the Greek translates it. This eternal message is not a mystery to us. We know it from Mark. When Mark gives us his gospel, he says this is the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man. In other words, of primary focus in the final days is to preach Jesus and Jesus and his blood alone. As we are heading to the end of time, the basis of redemption has not changed. The world is still saved through Jesus and Jesus alone. We must not get confused. Understanding prophecies does not mean you are saved. Owning a library on Daniel and Revelation, books by Ranko Stefanovich and any other author out there, it does not mean you are saved. One could be learned and unsaved. One could be highly educated and unsaved. The message of this angel is very clear, that as we warn the world about the end, in it we must also make Jesus the center of the warning. And I think again, this echoes what John has already said in chapter 1 when he said this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. What do I mean by this? To warn the world about its end without showing the grace, the love, the mercy of God through the cross of Jesus. That is what leads to conspiracy theories. Because Christ anchors the final message. After all, the message is about him. And so when we preach the end of time and we exclude Jesus, we design a runaway train. One that will go through the country picking up every conspiracy theory it can find. The message of the first angel is an everlasting gospel. The gospel of redemption through Jesus and Jesus alone. The cross has never been overshadowed. The cross remains the center of how we articulate even the future and the ending of this world. And so the angel continues to say that this message is being proclaimed to those who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. This language is similar to the language found in Revelation chapter 13, where it says those who were deceived by the beast belonged to every language, tribe, and peoples of this world. The parallelism in the language is very clear. Although this angel is preaching an everlasting gospel, the angel is preaching this everlasting gospel to those who do not believe in Jesus, those who have followed the beast. The angel seems to be giving an opportunity for people to repent because something is about to happen. The angel does not preach this message to those who have been identified previously in chapter 14. Remember that in Revelation chapter 14, from verse 1 to 5, we have already seen an image and a vision describing the followers of God as those who are now standing on Mount Zion. The following message is now directed clearly to those who are still in opposition to God. But it is a message of grace first. It is a message that says, accept the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior. Accept the corruption of sin that breaks human morality and human fiber. And know that only in Christ Jesus can we be saved. Why is this angel preaching this everlasting gospel? Because the hour for God to judge has come. Here, the idea of an hour does not necessarily imply a clock, but it implies that 
an appointed chronological sequence has arrived where God must now judge the world. It also does not imply kairos, which is time as it is articulated in an appointed season. This is not a generally appointed season, but it is a fixed chronological time when God is judging the fate of those who have not accepted the gospel. The angel cries out with a loud voice, a symbol that no one will be able to ignore the message. The message will be heard in every city, in every village, in every township, in every cave, in every valley, there will be nothing that will hinder anyone to hear the message so that no one is with an excuse to say, I did not hear that God was about to judge the nations of this world. I like the way the message is phrased. It is portrayed in sort of a court setting. And in a court setting, there are certain things that are done. For example, here in South Africa, the highest court in the land is the Constitutional Court. On it sits 11 justices, and the court is presided over by the Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court. In this country, it is Justice Muhueng Muhueng. It would be similar in the United States as well and in other countries. The Supreme Court, which is the highest court, has about nine justices presiding over it. Now, all these courts have a ceremony that they do when they are about to be in session. When the judges are about to enter, someone will make a very theatrical announcement. Hear ye, hear ye. The Constitutional Court of the Republic of South Africa is in session. The Chief Justice Muhueng Muhueng presiding. Let all people with business present themselves before the court. When this sound is made, every lawyer stands up. Every person in the audience stands. There is a silence. You see, the court has not made any judgment yet. But the court is about to judge. It is about to preside. This is why the angel flies with a loud voice. He is sending a clear message to the world. Hear ye, hear ye. The court of heaven has been convened. And God, the ruler of the universe, is, uh, is presiding over this court. This is why the next message is clear. What is the angel calling us to? He says, fear God. Keep his commandments. Why? Because you need to give him glory. Because the hour for him to judge has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. This is a call of acknowledging that no longer shall we debate what is the source of the universe. In other words, in a world full of theories about how the universe came to be, from theories of evolution, from theories of the Big Bang theory, from theories of other religions, God now takes his position as the only creator and judge of the universe. But this also is very important that we must share. Notice that him being a judge is connected to two things. It is connected to him as a creator, but it is also connected to the everlasting gospel. And the everlasting gospel is about him as a redeemer. I think that is very important that we pay attention to. He is the judge. What qualifies him to be the judge? He is the creator and the redeemer. In other words, not only did he make the world, when he also had made the world, when it fell apart, he redeemed the world. Therefore, he has authority, the justness, to be the one who judges the world. Not only did he make the world, but he also knows what it means to redeem the world. 
The credentials of God as the supreme judge are very clear. He is the maker and the redeemer. He is not just becoming a judge because he's got power. And that makes him different to the judges we have in this world. You see, when our courts are in session, the interesting thing about the judge is the judge neither created the court nor have they ever themselves been redeemed from the charges that will be viewed by the court. But our God is different. He is the maker of the world. But at the same time, he has tasted the sin he is about to preside over. That is why in him there is justice and mercy at the same time. While he gave the law that was broken in the Garden of Eden, he is also the same who tasted the wrath at the cross of that broken law. And thus he can judge the world because he made the world and redeemed the world. He gave it the law, but when the world broke the law, he also fixed the law that was broken. He atoned for the world and he rules the world. There is no better judge to surrender to than the judge who not only gives the law, but the judge who also knows how to die when the law is broken. This is the message that God is giving with the first angel. It calls upon everyone to say, do not question the credentials of the God who judges the world. He alone is fit to judge this world. It is a message that says to those who follow the beast and those who follow the message of deception, beware, the one who is about to judge you is merciful. If you are willing to listen and change, he is merciful. But if we are not willing to change, he is also able to pronounce a judgment that is punishing. Remember, the act of God to punish has in itself grace embedded because at some point, sin must come to an end. And so, grace does not necessarily mean the eternal favor that will not be curtailed or that will not have any judgment on it. Let this be a very clear message that while we are living in the last days, we have come to the time when God is judging. But the interesting thing also about this judgment is this. It is not necessarily the final judgment in which there is now a completion of the work and Jesus comes again. The first angel announces a judging, not a judgment. In other words, in the message of the first angel, God has not yet given a verdict. However, he is now judging those who are alive and those who are making decisions about their spirituality. This is often called the pre-advent judgment. In other words, it is the judgment before the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is a judgment also that I want to make very clear. This judgment is not based on what God will decide. Each and every person by their behavior, they are deciding for themselves where God must allocate them in the judgment. Those who want to be allocated in the book of life, then it is very simple. Choose Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Obey God and his commandments. Follow him in every instruction. That is the simplest way to decide. Should one not want to be in the book of life, then choose any other thing but Jesus. Choose any other thing but the grace of God. Choose any other thing but to fear him and honor him. This message of the first angel echoes the final call of Solomon, the preacher of preachers, 
when he says, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Perhaps let me make this very clear as we bring this message to an end. It is not my duty to investigate the mind of God. It is my duty to investigate his word, to believe in his word, to trust him and obey him. Many will lose their salvation because they want God to conform to their intelligence. We think somehow the events of the end of the world must follow my logic about how I would conclude the events of the world if I was God. Well, allow me to remind you of a very straightforward fact. You are not God, neither am I. So it will not help us to question how the events unfold. We are not God, we will never be God. How we would have logically concluded the event does not mean we possess the divine wisdom of the only true and wise God. It is important that as we follow this message of the three angels, some may look upon the message of salvation through Christ Jesus and say, why through Jesus? Why should it be Jesus? Why not this way or that way? Here's the point that I want to simplify. If you are God, give us your own son and crucify him. Then we will believe your version. But as far as we know, there is one God who made the universe. One God who saved us. One Jesus who was crucified. One resurrection came through him. One church was born through the Holy Spirit. And one Jesus is coming again. We will not conform to the ideas of men about what Jesus should have been and not been. Our entire focus is this message of the first angel. Fear God. Give him glory. Keep his commandments because the hour of his judging has come. And I say to each and every one of us, if you believe in Jesus, you have no reason to fear God when he sits to judge. When you are in court and you are innocent, the judge does not intimidate you because you know very well that this is about your vindication not about your condemnation. However, what do you do when you are guilty and the court is in session and you know very well that the judgment in the end will say you are guilty? Well, very simple. Before anything begins, before the prosecutor even states his case against you, you simply stand up and ask to address the court. You simply say to the presiding judge, my Lord, on the charges that have been laid before you about me, I confess I am guilty. I place myself at the mercy of the court because at the end, this court will come up with no other judgment but the fact that I am guilty. The invitation, therefore, of the first angel is very clear. If you know you are guilty, if you know that at the end the court of heaven will find you guilty with the sin, there is no reason to waste time. There is no reason to wait for the judge to preside when you know very well the judgment. There is a simpler way to deal with this court case. What is the simpler way? The John who writes the book of Revelation gives us the simpler way when he writes to us in John 1, when we read from uh, verse 9 in the book of 1 John. He says, my children, I write that you may not sin. But if you sin, we have an advocate, a paracletos. We have an advocate who is Christ Jesus, who is able to speak on our behalf. Why wait for the judge to make his judgment? Simply call upon the advocate Jesus. 
and tell the advocate, plead my case. I am guilty and only through your blood and your intercession will the court find me innocent. Plead my case. This is the message of the first angel. Fear God. Fear him. Fear him because if you are not in Christ Jesus, then the consequences of his judging will be dire. We chose Jesus. We chose him because ultimately we knew when the court sits, no one will give us the ability to be judged and found innocent other than Christ Jesus. There is a song that is sung in my home language that I love. It talks about the disciples and their commitment to the gospel. The song simply says, Besuka bamlandela, bazishia izono zabo, bashii miziabo, basuka bamlandela. And if I were to translate it, it simply says, they left everything behind and followed him. The first angel is saying, God has begun to judge the nations of this world. There is a way to escape a, gil a guilty verdict. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus and the verdict will not be guilty on your behalf. Let us pray to God as we conclude this message. Father, in the name of Jesus, one prayer we have. As you judge the nations, may our names be found in the book of life. This is our prayer through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.